everyone. I'm Joan from Hoya. Thank you for joining us tonight. And welcome to the final part of our Myopia Management Series, which is a collaboration between Singapore Polytechnic and Hoya Land Singapore. Hope that you have enjoyed the past three sessions so far. For those who are here with us, what is different for today's session is that we are excited that an external guest speaker, Mr. Michael Rigo from Hutch Right, is joining us for the live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So during the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to type that in the Q&A chat box and we will have them answered at the end. So here we are, reaching part four, which is the last part of our myopia management series, where we will share about the importance of Excel length measurement. As there has been a growing awareness of Excel length in the recent years, due to the increased risk of ocular diseases that are associated with high myopia and increased Excel length. Therefore, monitoring of Excel length should become one of the crucial factors in myopia management, as well as to evaluate the efficacy of the myopia control method. For today, which marks the final part of the series, we will have Docus together with Sky as a co-speaker, to cover the importance of Excel length in monitoring myopia progression and how we can measure and analyze Excel length as part of our myopia control treatment plan. Without further ado, let's welcome Dockers and Sky to start the session. Dockers and Sky, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, hello. To introduce yourself first. Yep. Hi everyone, my name is Kai. I'm here together with Dockers, who is the main speaker for this CPE. So today she'll be focusing on the importance of SL lamp measurement in myopia control and the tool to help you to go about doing so. So let's us begin this quick and fast. Dockers, please introduce yourself and we shall begin. Thank you, Sky, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dockers, and yes, let us begin with our agenda of the day and the rest of the presentation. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. So firstly, I will talk about what is Excel length and what are the normative values that we can look out for and some growth charts that have been uh, done by research after which the relation between axial length and myopia, and of course, the importance of measuring axial length. To end of the session, we have a special guest speaker, um, as mentioned by Joan, who will be speaking on optical biometry, as well as myopia management software that can help you in your practice. So before we begin, let us do a quick rec recap on our previous sessions uh, of CPE and what we have covered so far. Okay, so first we have covered the prevalence, risk factors, differences between um, myopia correction versus myopia management, as well as the benefits of myopia management, what are the different treatment methods that are available in the market, and also some dispensing guide as well as tips. And lastly, of course, um, we have covered how should we manage the expectations of the parents as well as the aftercare and handling of parents' concerns. As for today, we will be focusing on Excel length in the monitoring of myopia progression. So firstly, when a child comes back for a review or would like to change a pair of glasses, we will do refraction during every visit to determine the power whether or not um, there are any changes or whether it is required of them to change a pair of glasses. So besides refraction, did you know that we can also use axial length measurement to monitor myopia progression as well? So let's move on uh, with the presentation to find out about axial length measurement. Axial length is actually measured with a uh, optical biometer or a scan, which I will elaborate on these two later on. Yeah, so there's actually a strong correlation between um, refractive error and the eye's axial length. So 
long exhale length could be associated with ocular conditions and that is why it's important to monitor it. So like I mentioned earlier, right, refractive error should be used in conjunction with exhale length measurements to evaluate the success of um, myopia management treatments. Yeah. Right, yes. But why should we measure refraction and exhale length together? Yeah, so as we know, right, refraction can be more variable than exhale length because children do accommodate during refraction and we are unable to control that accommodation. So this actually causes a variation in our refraction from visit to visit. And exhale length is not affected by accommodation. So as long as we take good readings, I would say that um, the result of exhale length is taken is actually pretty consistent. Yeah, then we can um, compare the excel length against their power to see the correlation as well. So after knowing excel length measurement should be taken with reflection, help us to understand a little bit more about excel length. Doctors. What is actually excel length is about? Yeah, so excel length right, is typically defined as the excel distance from the anterior cornea to the retina. So cornea, as we all know, is a transparent outer layer um, at the front part of the eye and the retina is located at the back of our eye. It receives light and sends signals to the brain so that we can see um, the images. Well, uh, SLI is definitely something new to us. Uh, most of our audience over here, share with us some fun fact about SLI that you know, is good to know. Mm. So did you know that like a full-term newborn baby's eyeball, right, is an average of 16 mm to 18 mm long and it actually grows to approximately like 19.5 mm in an infant. Yeah, and studies suggest that um, the eye actually reaches um, adult amotropic excel length by the age of 13 years old which is when we are starting to become teenagers at that time. So usually we start to grow taller at 13 years old, but our eyeball length is already at the adult length by then. So um, excel length that is longer than average are at a greater risk of myopia-associated pathologies and resultant visual impairment. Wow, uh, 18 mm, that is slightly smaller than our 50 cent coin. Mm. Yeah. Right, so then, what is the average SL length that we can compare to when we advise our patient? Yeah, so that's a very good question, uh, Sky. So the table over here, right, actually shows the normative um, XL length values in percentiles of three age groups. So six years old, nine years old, and 15 years old. So the data is actually split into European and Chinese children. Um, as well as females and males reported by two separate studies. So I will let you guys know what is the average measurements to look out for. So let's take a look at the 50th percentile of um, the age groups, which means the average of the cohort. Lah. So female is on the left side and then the male is on the um, right side. So at six years old, right, you can see that the excel length of European children is about 22.06 to 22.59, okay? And then Chinese children is about 22.54 to 22.99. So let's just skip to the 15-year-old um, uh, children when their eyes are already at the adult length, okay? So we can see that European children, right, their excel length is at 23.15 to 23.65. And Chinese children, you can see that it's longer, so it's like about 24.37 to 25.01 even. Yeah. So oh. what do you think about the excel length, Sky? <laughs> right. Uh, I think it's important to highlight to our audience with us today, from this table that Dr. shared with us, we know that in general, Chinese children, our descent, meaning our future son and daughters, have a longer excel length than our European counterpart. Which means we are all affected, especially in Singaporean, uh, in Singapore, uh, majority ethnic is uh, Chinese. And I believe this affects the East Asian, which is including the Indians and possibly the Malay as well. We have a higher possibility of having a longer SLM, which is also equivalent to a higher probability of my developing myopia and ocular pathology that is related to myopia. 
So this is why I think today our topic is very important that we need to communicate to the parent that myopia management control is essential. It's not just about the power increase, you need to change your glasses to see clearly, but we want to put the stop or try to slow down a problem that could effectively affect our children's future, their eyesight because of uh, myopia related eye diseases. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I do agree with you. Yeah, I do agree with you, Sky. Yes. It's very, very important, this topic. Yeah. So let's move on to the next slide over here. Hmm, yeah. So uh, from here, right, I would like to show you guys some Excel length growth charts as well. So this study is actually, uh, they actually collected the data of a large sample of children. So it can determine if the child's Excel length is above average for his or her age. And this information can be used to estimate the risk of developing high myopia yeah so do you think like this growth charts is uh, very useful in the future sky yes i think that's definitely useful for our audience uh, me myself included you know this could be a very useful point of reference with high prevalency of myopia uh, this could be very very useful it support us to help to manage myopia because you show that you can show this to a parent a prediction of what is going to happen to their child in the future, right? Especially this is evidence based. And even, you know, uh, if the child is just very slightly myopic, we should be able to start them on myopia control to prevent it from accelerating, right? We got to need the problem when it's more. I think in our previous session, we highlighted this uh, time after time. It couldn't be more important that we need to highlight this again. We need to start early. Yes, that is so right. Yeah, so then the next important part will be excel length and myopia. Yeah, so uh, Sky, can you introduce yeah, a bit? Uh, after knowing the average length, uh, average excel length value and the presence of this growth chart, what are the range of excel length increase uh, of the risk of ocular pathological then? Mm. So, um, research has actually shown that axial length is more closely related uh, with ocular pathology, especially in those with axial length of more than 26 mm. Yeah. Right, I see. So, 26, 26 mm is a very important number, right? Yeah, mm. it's a um, magical number, or rather, this is a number that we should not exceed. Uh, it's a number that we need to say no. How then uh, does SLM measurement translate into doubters? You know, uh, we deal with doubters a little bit more frequently. So how could ECP relate that with doubters? Mm. So it was actually, yeah, thanks guys. So it was actually found that um, uh, the correlation of SLM length with doubters, right, is actually not con constant throughout the years. So actually, one mm of axial length difference is associated with like three point one three doubters um, of refractive difference in low myopes and one point seven two doubters uh, refractive difference for high myopes. So um, if you have a PD ruler right now, right, you can actually take it out and put your finger at the one mm mark. So those who don't have, you can imagine with me. So 1mm is actually very tiny on the ruler, but it has a huge impact in the increase in power um, in your eyes. Yeah, so like for low myopes, right, 1mm means like 3.13 doubters change in power. So what can we deduce from this slide, right, is actually 1mm excel length difference has a more profound impact um, on refractive error in low myopes compared to high myopes. Yeah? Right. Um... Now let's let's just talk a little bit more about SLA and the risk of a uh, visual impairment that happen with together with it. So in, in this table, it shows the risk of visual impairment by the age of sixty and uh, seventy five. Generally, uh, the longer the SL length is, the risk increases with it. Um, Tokas, could you tell us more about this? Chart? What is what it could mm. actually tell mm. us too? Mm. Yeah, so thanks guys. So we can see from this table, right, they actually measured the excel length from uh, 24mm to about 30mm uh, plus. 
So when it hits 28 to 30 mm or more than 30 mm, the risk of visual impairment significantly increases, as you can see from the table. And because of the uh, strong correlation between myopia as well as axial length in most individuals, we should all the more control myopia progression to prevent the eyeball from elongating. So far, we have been looking into refraction and SL length measurement. How can we use these two in terms of diagnosing and monitoring of myopia? Hmm. So the refractive status of our eye is pretty complex. So that is to say that there's a variation in axial length between um, eyes. Okay. So actually, our cornea and crystalline lens power also contributes to the refractive status of our eye. So for example, right, there can be um, two eyes that are 0 0.5 diopters, but one eye has a longer axial length than the other but a flatter corneal curvature. So this actually can result in our eyes um, uh, having different axial length but with the same power. So therefore, right, the optimal way to diagnose mon uh, myopia is with refractive error because two individuals with the same power can have different axial lengths due to the difference in corneal and uh, crystalline lens power. Okay? But on the other hand, Measuring of axial length with an optical biometer is good to monitor myopia progression because like I mentioned um, in the earlier part of the presentation, axial length is not affected by accommodation and also it is more sensitive than refraction. And most importantly, right, eye diseases related to myopia progression is mostly caused by excess axial elongation. So, Optical biometry is more sensitive, like I mentioned just now, as it is able to detect a 0.012 mm change in axial length, which is approximately about 0.03 diopters. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, um, that is a very precise way to measure axial length uh, to be in two decimal points. So, a uh, 2.99 mm could be detected. It made e easier for, uh, uh, not easier for the eye care practitioner to detect very slight changes. Uh, I think it gives us a signal to monitor the children's power changes very closely. So it fit into our fundamental goal of myopia management, that is to slow down the rate of SL length elongation while monitoring their power progression closely. That's right. Okay, great. Now let's move on to our poll question. All right, so here's the first poll for today. How many common ways are there to measure Excel length? One, two, three, or four? We have about a minute to complete poll number one. Most of you, I see that uh, you all have chosen two common ways. Some have chosen three as well. Okay, so let me just go into the poll discussion over here. Okay, so um, axial length measurement actually utilizes the principle of signal reflection to measure the difference between the various ocular structures and the overall length of the eye. So firstly, there is a scan, yeah, also known as amplitude scan. It uses ultrasound for measurement. And which means that it is measured by an ultrasound probe that comes into contact with the cornea or by immersing the probe into a saline field shell. So because it requires contact, topical anesthetic is required and children can actually get intimidated by the anesthetic drop or the probe itself, which can be a barrier for um, eye care professionals to measure axial length previously. Next, we have optical biometry, which uses laser interferometry. So some ex examples include IOL master, lens star myopia, or Maya. So this technique is non-contact, and therefore it is easier to execute on children. This, met this method has been widely used um, in multiple myopia control studies to do their clinical trials. Okay, so let's move on with the presentation and I'll elaborate a bit more on optical biometry later on.
Okay, coming back after the after the poll, before we proceed further, let help our audience to recap and some of the importance of SLM that we have gone through so far. Talkers, hmm. help the audience to do so. Yep. Okay. So first, which is pretty much the most important one, it is to evaluate the effectiveness of myopia management treatments. So for example, children undergoing ortho treatment requires monitoring of their ax axial length to determine the effectiveness of uh, the treatment. And another example, which I have mentioned previously, will be two children having the same uh, refractive error, uh, refractive error, yeah, refractive power, but one has a longer axial length. So the child with a longer axial length needs to be monitored more closely. Yeah. And second, of course, is to predict the risk for myopia development for an individual um, child. So earlier in the presentation, we have mentioned on the studies of growth curve that predicts the risk of low or high myopia in adulthood. So this is actually very useful when, when we can predict, we can actually prevent severe consequences in the future. Yeah. And last, it is to determine the risk of associated pathology for um, an individual child as well. So these pathologies can include um, retinal detachment, myopic maculopathy, as well as glaucoma. Before that being said, I think it's important to point out that SLM measurement is actually as important as doing the refraction in terms of uh, monitoring myopia progression and vice versa. I think uh, to help to the audience to relate is something like, you know, you couldn't take a weight of a person to just determine whether it's obese or not. You have to consider their height as well. You know, independently, it doesn't really tell much. But when it's being put together, it creates a meaning to the subject we're going to talk about. Yes, so please do keep in mind, SLM measurement is actually as important when we are doing our refreshing. Mm. Next, let's discuss an example of myopia management with spectacle lenses with dim technology, uh, something new as in uh, the field. Um, they started a two-year clinical trial and later on published a third-year trial assessing the effect of DIMS technology in myo managing myopia. So let us ask to at the two years trial result. Focus. Mm, so the sample included two groups of children. So one group wears DIMS lenses and the other group actually wears single vision lenses. So the re result was that the axial elongation was slowed down by an average of um, 60% after two years of wearing DIMS lenses. Yeah, so this is actually pretty significant because now we have more and more options available in the market to slow down progression of axial length and myopia as well. So parents have more variations now to choose from. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that's the two years result. In the third year, there, uh, we know that there's this two group of children that's being assessed as well, where they participate in a two years clinical trial previously. So these two group are, you know, the children that wear the DIMS lenses, they continue to wear the DIMS lenses, calling the DIMS group. And the children who have one single vision and then they switch to DIMS lenses. Mm, yeah. What is in for us in the third year clinical result? Yes, so for children who has worn the DIMS lenses throughout the three years, right, the treatment effect was sustained, meaning that the axial elongation was still slowed down by an average of 60%. But as for children who switched from DIMS lenses on the third year only, this is actually the axial elongation, okay, during the first two years of wearing single vision. So you can look at the yellow per, uh, portion of the graph. It, the area is actually pretty big, which means that their increase was uh, quite a lot. And this was the axial elongation when they actually switched to DIMS lenses on the third year. So there's a significant uh, decrease in the rate of axial elongation. So you can see that at the yellow portion, it's actually pretty small. Yeah. Wow. All right. This is a very impressive result. I think it really emphasized on the importance of myopia management should begin early to prevent the increased rate of SLA and growth elongation. So the earlier you start, the earlier you they can start to slow down the SLA elongation, which is the crucial for the children because there's no U-turn over here. Doctors, 
just a question to come about before we move on to the next slide. Is yes. there any exclusion uh, during the experiment, like, you know, children doesn't wear 12 hours and then you start to exclude for the result just to make sure that these results are really the, all the participants included? Mm, uh, there are no exclusions, actually. We included all, um, all the children, actually. In the in the in the clinical trial, yeah. Nice. This gives me a lot of confidence with the result. Yeah. All right. In the earlier part of our presentation, you know, you briefly mentioned about the optical biometry. As we all know, bio optical biometry is widely used now for SL lens measurement. Let's help the audience and me, you know, to understand more about it. Hmm, yeah, so we all know um, some optical biometry in the market right now. So for example, there's IOL Master, there's Maya, and there's Lenstar. So basically, um, why is it commonly used is actually because of these three factors over here that you see on the slide. So firstly, it is a non-contact measurement, which means that it does not scare any children. And therefore, it makes it easier to uh, execute as well, and it's a very fast method. So it's very efficient. Yeah, and second is the ease of alignment, meaning that um, it becomes easier for you guys, eye, pro eye care professionals, to capture accurate readings for children because children tend to move their head around and then their attention span is pretty short. So they do not need to focus long on the fixi fixation target on the machine in order to capture um, good readings. And third, of course, um, is actually high precision measuring measurements so this is actually good for analyzing minute changes in Excel length, which can convert into a small increase in power. So actually, um, three to five readings are usually taken and the average Excel length is calculated and taken if the readings do not vary too much from each other. Okay, so with all that being said, yeah, let's move on to another poll. Question is, did you know that there are myopia management softwares they can help you with data analysis and myopia management. So I see that most of you all have chosen yes, that there's a myopia management software available. Okay, let me move on to the next slide first. Okay, so yeah, the answer is yes for the poll. So there are myopia management software um, available in the market currently to support you in terms of data analysis as well as myopia management for your customers. We have a special guest speaker to tell us more about the software and he is Mr. Michael Rager. So Mr. Michael Rager is working as a product manager with Hugstrike and is responsible for the development and marketing of the optical biometer as well as the bundle of optical biometer and the myopia management software. The close contact and exchange with myopia experts along the development process made him fascinated by the topic of myopia in children, a topic in which importance will drastically grow in the near future. So let's welcome him to talk more about it. So hello everyone, as mentioned, my name is Michael Rieger and I have the pleasure to speak about the role of axial length measurements in myopia control. I would like to start my presentation with a statement published by the World Health Organization, which might have been stated by various uh, peer-reviewed studies as well. According to the WHO, more than 50% of the world population, which accounts for 5 billion people, will be myopic in the year 2050. About 10% of 1 billion people will be high myopic. I'm quite sure you heard about these numbers already and thus you might understand why myopia and children gained a huge amount of attention recently. Let's find out about the means at our disposal to battle this global pandemic. This presentation should convey general information about myopia in children. I will speak about available treatments uh, and consequences of myopia in children. Furthermore, I will present which parameters are important to monitor myopia progression. And last but not least, uh, how to educate children and their parents by using our software, which supports you during the close monitoring of myopia in children. Since myopia is the most common cause of impaired vision in people 
until midst of life. I guess I don't have to explain neither how it occurs nor how to correct it. Every one of you knows how myopia manifests in terms of the architecture of the eye. So now let's have a look at the risk factors or causes that favor myopia. The first one is genetics. For example, um, for example, the prevalence of becoming myopic is considerably higher in, in Asia. However, also living conditions play a role and might be even more important when it comes to the development of the eye and the eye becoming myopic. Simply said, the genetic controls how strong the eye is influenced by the living conditions uh, itself. As an example, Johannes Kepler stated in the 16th century that myopia is more prevalent in students, which was also proven in, in 2013, several hundred years later by Fairhof in another study. I wrote that the optical system can be seen as a risk factor. What I mean by optical system is the control loop, which is influenced by the environment and potentially directly impacts the eye growth. It has been shown in the past that the retina adapts the thickness of the sclera in accordance with the sign depending on the ametropia. That is even the case after cutting through the optic nerve. It is also known that ametropization is regulated by the peripheral retina to a high extent and not only the fovea, as people agreed on previously. Overall, there are more risk factors uh, that haven't been revealed yet. Uh, as you might all know, myopia in children is a very popular topic in research currently. Let's see what, we'll we, what we will find out in the months and years to come. So what about the prevalence? Um, the figures given here may differ from publication to publication, but the trend is clear. It is apparent that myopia is becoming more prevalent in the population, as also the WHO stated recently. Now you might ask yourself, why is this worth considering? Uh, because this can be corrected quite easily. This is indeed true and there will be uh, no shortage of optician stores or eyeglass frames in the year 2050. However, it is the drastically increased likelihood of late effects uh, such as glaucoma or retinal detachment, which can be associated with myopia and especially high myopia. As you can see in this uh, illustration at the bottom line at minus six, di minus six diopters, you can see quite high probability of future pathology. Unfortunately, there is no therapy today that can completely stop myopia in children. However, there are always uh, ways to slow down its progress. There is a possibility to use spectacle lenses, for example, contact lenses, and among the optical interventions, spectacle lenses have the advantage of being easy to put on and therefore they are easy to accept by the children. Speaking about uh, spectacle lenses, DIMS spectacle lenses cause the retina to receive a blurred projection and has been shown that uh, daily wear of DIMS spectacles uh, significantly retard myopia progression and axial length elongation in myopic children. Also, you might know that multifocal soft contacts and AutoK have been uh, therapies used in uh, myopia control. Atropine uh, is a possibility from pharmacology uh, to reduce eye growth, as you all know. You might also know that there is also controversy about the optimal dosage in pharmacological uh, control. But also um, environmental factors. So risk factors can have a strong influence on myopia progression. For example, the duration of the exposure to sunlight or more generally time spent outdoors. Also, there are some question marks. Where does the effect come from? Is it the light intensity or is it, is our, is it the components of the light? As you see, there are great uh, therapies around to slow down myopia progression in children. And I'm quite sure there are more innovations to come to tackle myopia in the future. Next, I would like to discuss the components of myopia management, which have been defined by the International Myopia Institute. Uh, these are to identify the risk factors, for example, existing myopia for parents. The awareness of myopia must be raised through education of the parents. Uh, appropriate interventions must be impl implemented. Appropriate in sense of understanding of the initial situation of the child's life situation 
um, which should be taken into account for proactive action. Why? Because the early detection paired with proactive measures can significantly reduce myopia progression and its manifestation. There's an example of a guideline which has been published recently about how often to assign children at different age. And there, as you can see here on the bottom right, uh, it should happen once between three and five years old and then yearly until the age of 18, so until adult age. In order to detect the onset of myopia in children, various risk factors must be considered as we just heard. Until now, one of the best ways uh, was to determine the, the refractive error in 2014. And a single stage model appeared uh, that predicted an increased risk of becoming myopic at a refractive error less than or equal minus 0.5 diopters in children below 10 years. Another multi-stage model was published in 2015, predicting uh, that children which are less hypopic than indicated in this table shown um, have a greater than 80% probability of being myopic by the age of 13. Since 2016 and 2017, there are now also percentile curves, so grow curves available, which allow a similar prediction of myopia by using the axial length. If you are parents, you might certainly know that grow curves are commonly used uh, in childhood health to gauge um, eight weight and head circumference, for example. The data published by Diedemann allow to predict the myopia risk um, of a child by the eye length uh, in relation to its age. Uh, these data are based on, on a cohort of European children. Yes, published grow curves for Asian eyes two years later, and who published a study uh, a few months ago in which uh, information about the time of the myopia onset can be used to predict both the refractive error and the axial length in the future. As you can see, there's a lot of research and publications going ongoing, not only in treatment options, but also in the detection and prediction models. Myopia is described uh, by the power, the optic lens uh, that is required to correct the resulting uh, visual impairment. Thus, it isn't surprising that the assessment of myopia progression has historically been performed by the refractive error. It is valid that uh, refractive state is considered a very important parameter for myopia detection, monitoring and, monitoring and control. However, the downside of these measurements is the poor repeatability when compared to ultrasonography or interferometry measurements, for example, as non-cycloplastic refractions tend to overestimate myopian uh, in children, cycloplastic refractions rendered more reliable at the cost of increased effort in time. When using autocray uh, to intentionally uh, alter the refractive error during uh, myopia control, the only possibility to determine the refractive state of a child is to measure it after a washout period, meaning the topography of the corner has to return to the original state, which isn't neither convenient to the patient nor to the eye care professional. A similar hurdle is found uh, during atropine treatment, and during which the direct correlation between the change of refraction error, uh, a refractive error and axial length is not always given. Now let's come to the question why axial length is an important parameter in myopia control. In most cases, uh, the cause for myopia isn't found in the optical components of the anterior eye, but in the excess of the axial length, which makes the axial length the principal contributor to the refractive error. Furthermore, the relationship between the axial length and the refractive error may be nonlinear and vary with the child's age or even the size of the eye or the length of the eye. Axial length measurements can also change one's clinical uh, management plan, such as in cases of a mismatch between the myopia and axial length, as I just mentioned. An example of this is how low myop with long axial length were the higher than expected risk for future pathology may lead uh, to a more proactive management strategy. As of uh, today, uh, in research settings, the International Myopia Institute, uh, for example, agrees that refractive error should be 
used in conjunction with axial length measurements to evaluate the success of uh, certain treatments. You might think now, yeah, it has been a standard in research currently, far away from being used uh, in everyday myopia control. I would say besides that there are many myopia experts out there telling that it's a very important marker for them. I can't imagine comprehensive myopia management without axial length measurements. Now I spoke a lot about myopia and important parameters in myopia control. Let me show you how our myopia management software can support you during everyday myopia sessions. The software is separated into four main areas. It's refraction, uh, biometry, environment, and the myopia report. Refraction and biometry, I just spoke about. Let's, have, uh, let's start with these two software features. Once the refractive state of a child has been entered into our software, we show the progression curves of the refractor, refractive error until the age of 18, so until the adult age. This visualization or the, this, or the software visualizes are, is based on study data and show how myopia would progress uh, if untreated or treated by a variety of treatment methods. This illustration is very important when it comes to the communication with the patients uh, or children or parents, uh, as it shows how the child's myopia might manifest once the child becomes adult. And furthermore, it compares the different treatments. Thus, it is a very valuable tool to explain to the parents why you would suggest a certain treatment or why you wouldn't and which outcome uh, it might or to which outcome it might lead. Once uh, you follow a child for several years, um, several refractive data are shown. These are the blue uh, curves, which are shown in the center of the picture. This helps to follow the progression of myopia. And also it indicates how the current treatment impacts the progression of myopia when compared to the untreated case. So you can see the blue, uh, the blue and on the left and the other color on the right, these um, are two treatment methods. Blue one is the one which was pre previously performed and the, on the right one is the ongoing treatment and you see these two prediction curves. The upper one is the untreated one and the lower one is the current treatment in this example, the DIMS technology. The different treatments can be individually added or altered within the software. For example, the DIMS technology, uh, for example, uh, showed the reduction of myopia progression of 59% in a two-year study. Uh, this is also what you see here on the right for the efficiency. Um, if, for example, a similar study would be performed for different ethnicities or for a longer time, this data could be di directly entered by the eye care professional, which makes our software really adjustable to your needs. The next element, uh, the biometry, is all about axial length. Here you see a biometry measurement, how it looks like during the measurement process. The quality of a biometry reading depends on several factors. It is important to use a precise optical biometer. Automated positioning is very supportive for measurements uh, performed on children. And also proper positioning uh, of the child and visual fixation is important. A small side note, if you would like the children to be uh, to wriggle less, make them not have free hanging feet. You will see the difference. Sometimes I get asked how many uh, biometry readings uh, to perform. It is of advantage if you get an idea about the standard deviation of the axial length measurement, for example, during the measurement process. You can see here the standard deviation on um, for both eyes and even how it alters during the measurements. Having this information allows you to easily add more measurements in case of uh, not sufficient quality or to, to finish directly after free measurements if the quality is sufficient. You can directly see this during the measurement on the measurement screen. Once the biometry measurements uh, are completed, the axial length will be presented visually overlaid over the grow curves, the grow curves which I just spoke about before. Uh, again, these curves indicate based on the age and the axial length of the child, how high the probability is to be myopic or high myopic in adult age for this particular ch uh, child. 
when following the axial length changes over time, similar to the example I just showed you for the refractive error, um, changes over time, the eye care profession together with the child and the parents can evaluate the performance of a particular treatment. As you can see here, uh, these two colored regions, these indicate different treatments applied over the years. As I mentioned in the very beginning of the presentation, increased axial length and low myope might call for more drastic treatment, meaning children in the 75th, um, the 75 uh, percentile or higher of axial length for their age are at high risk of uh, high myopia and deserve most effective treatment strategies. You won't get this information without axial length measurements. A small side note, more axial length pro curves can be added to the software directly by the eye care professional, uh, as there is a lot of research going on, uh, a published um, growth chart of an Asian population, for example, can be directly added to our software as soon as the data is available to the public. No software update is needed to perform this step, which makes you really having the latest information in your software quite easily. Next point is the environmental and risk factors. They are really important when it comes to myopia management. As some risk factors are known to have a significant impact on the myopia management progress, uh, progression, it is interesting for the eye care professional to know them uh, in order to optimize the management um, process. Furthermore, it is a great opportunity to motivate parents to contribute to slow down the myopia progression of their child. For this reason, we implemented a questionnaire. For example, we implemented the following questions. How many of the parents are myopic? The age of the myopia onset, time spent reading, and time spent outside. On this screen, how you can see how it looks like with an overview. Um, there's even a small, a little help. And once you filled out this questionnaire, a graph is shown which provides the basis for further discussion with the parents. The eye care professional can emphasize these risk factors and have a look if the parents really took care about separating the child from the tablet or a PC and send them outside to play, for example. This questionnaire is a really powerful tool to educate the parents about myopian children and how they can contribute. So, for example, what you can see here is on the really bottom um, the question about the myopia and parent of the parents where it's a constant factor which has a negative impact on the myopia progression. You can also see the age of myopia, so the myopia onset, which has a huge negative impact on myopia progression. And as well, you have variable um, questions like the time spent in near work, so in time reading or time outside. So time reading has also a negative impact, um, but varies over time, as you can see from this graph. And also there's the time spent outside where you can see over the years that it increased. And thus, it helped to slow down myopia progression to a certain extent. Once more, uh, the question can be adapted if there's a new study uh, coming up. Uh, another important risk factor, which might be important, then easily the eye care professional uh, could adapt to these latest findings of myopia experts or even research. The myopia report um, is a great tool for patient education and you might uh, guess it right, it's customizable to the needs of the eye care professional. Here's an example of such a report, um, which you can see here on the top right, you can see the patient information on the first page in general, you have the biometry and refractive readings. Uh, here you can export it as a PDF file format you can enter the next, the date of the next appointment. Um, this is a great take home message. On the second page, you have the refractive progression chart. You have the axial length progression chart and the environmental progression chart. These are exactly the same charts uh, I just presented and which are available in our software. And it's really nice if during the myopia management session, they are discussed with their parents and then they can take it home and think about it, even uh, educate their partners about myopia and what I just heard about it in the myopia session. Furthermore, we provide uh, another page with the treatment methods. So there's the previously performed treatments and the ongoing treatment. And there's even additional information about the ongoing treatment 
about side effects, for example, or what the parents might cope with. All this information can be added to this report. And the last pages are overall information about myopia, as I just presented you in the beginning of this presentation, which are really helpful for the parents to understand at home what is myopia, how to perform myopia control, and what are important risk factors. To summarize, where do the information come from? You can add refractive error information from subjective or objective uh, refractive error measurements. Uh, the biometry data come from our optical biometer and the environment, the, the risk factor questionnaire is answered during the myopia session. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Michael Rega, for the presentation and share, in sharing in detail on how the myopia management software can help to support us in our myopia management journey. You can see that this slide has a red border, which means that you can take a screenshot of this slide. It is a summary of my presentation, so please feel free to do so. Okay, so firstly, even though it may not always be correlated, Studies have shown strong relationship between the eye's axial length and its refractive error. And also that axial length of more than 26 mm is more closely related to ocular pathology. And once again, here are the three reasons why we should measure axial length. Firstly, to evaluate the effectiveness of myopia management treatments. Second, to predict the risk for myopia development. And third is to determine the risk of associated pathologies. And lastly, to obtain precise measurement, an optical biometer should be used, as well as a myopia management software can be used to analyze and present uh, the data. So we need to attract attention of the parents to this situation and make use of this to explain the effects of high myopia and long axial length. From there, we can have appropriate interventions such as myopia control methods of um, maybe spectacle lenses, um, subcontact lenses, auto K, or refer to the ophthalmologist for atropine treatment. So this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Let me pass the time on to Joan. Thank you, doctors. So, all right, we, we have reached the Q&A session. So as the topic of Excel length might be relatively new to most of us, so let's spend a bit more time to understand more about it. So here's the first question. Will Excel length change my myopia treatment plan for my patient? Doctors, would you like to take this question? All right, can I'll take the first question. Okay, so this um, will excel length actually change the myopia management plan, right? It actually changes the proactivity needed for the treatment. So for example, two kids can have the same power of uh, minus four diopters, but maybe one has the excel length of 24 mm and then the other one has excel length of 25 mm. So actually the child with a 25 mm of excel length need to be uh, closely monitored and more um, proactive treatment needs to be done to ensure that the treatment method is really working for the child. And if not, it will be good to quickly consider to switch the treatment option. Yeah, so that's my take on this. Hmm. We can move on to the next question. Okay, so yeah, hi, I see Mr. Michael. Hi there. Hello. Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, so the next question that we have is we may not offer all the treatment methods shown in the software, is it possible to remove those treatment methods that we do not provide? Mr. Michael, yeah. would you like to take this question? Yes, sure. Thank you very much for this question. Um, this is a commonly asked uh, by IQ specialists and the answer is definitely yes, it is possible. Um, it is possible to remove a treatment method which makes completely sense if a particular treatment is not provided by the IQ specialist. Uh, I would also like to mention that the description of a treatment might be changed as well by the ICA specialist if wanted, and this description would then be shown up uh, in the myopia report. 
Okay, understand. Right, let's move on to the next question. So will the software record or capture the combined management? Mm -hmm. So there basically you have the possibility of a combined uh, management or combined treatment when it comes for the DIM technology, for example, in combination with Atropine. And there you can add an other treatment uh, op uh, option like we discussed before, we can remove one, but we can also add another one. And then you can just describe it as Atropine plus DIMS technology, for example, with a, a appropriate description and efficacy factor. This is possible. Okay, then now for the other question is, based on your experience, what feedback um, do you have so far after using the machine and software? Mm -hmm. um, for our optical biometer, I've heard that we provide really precise measurements of the axial length and that biometry measurements performed on children are working out re really well. Um, our myopia software ma uh, management software, on the other hand, is extremely helpful uh, to ICA specialists. This is what I hear a lot. Um, for example, when it comes to presenting information during the myopia management session towards the parents. This is because we present uh, the refractive state, the axial length and the risk factors, and we visualize uh, them in a very understandable way. Uh, especially the prediction of different treatment methods for different uh, um, treatments. So the um, probability of becoming myopic and to which extent is really an excellent asset of our software that allows the ICA specialist to present to the parents why a certain treatment would be uh, chosen and what the outcome to expect once the child uh, becomes adult. So this is really a unique feature for us. Yeah, that sounds really good. All right, so the last question that we have here is, how to capture the attention of a child during biometry measurements? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, avoid free hanging feet of the children during the measurement process. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, you will clearly see the difference. You will not see the kid wriggling around that much. Also uh, try to uh, get their attention to something rather close to the optical biometer during the measurement process. Uh, in particular cases, it might help to send the parents outside of the examination room uh, during the measurements as well. This has to be defined then by the ICA specialist, of course. I see, got it. Okay, so thank you for all the questions and thank you, Dr. and Mr. Michael, for answering them. So before we really end welcome. today's session, Mr. Michael, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience? For me, I just say thank you very much for having me. Uh, if there's any question after the presentation, just uh, reach out to me at any time. Um, I'm always here to support you and uh, have a great day or a great afternoon. <laughs> okay, glad to hear that. So once Thank again, you, special Michael. thanks to Mr. Michael for taking time to join us today. Have a great day ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have reached the final part of the session. Thank you to all our speakers okay, for the informative presentation as well to everyone else who joined us tonight. We hope that you find our myopia management series useful. And from there, you are able to gain more confidence in introducing myopia control to your customers. By embarking on this myopia management journey, not only will it be beneficial to the myopic child, it can also help to elevate your business to another level. So start to control the child's myopia with the appropriate myopia control method instead of just correcting it. With that, I shall end today's session. Thank you for your kind attention. Please remember to complete the feedback and quiz form by using the link provided in the chat box or by scanning the QR code. We look forward to seeing you again in our next CPE session. Till then, take care and good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone.